Did you know that there is a movie that's equal parts Godzilla, Legend of Zelda, and Power Rangers, but it's influenced by 80s dark fantasy animated adventures like Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings, Disney's The Black Cauldron, or Rankin Bass's The Last Unicorn? But it's a DBZ film. Why? Yes, there is. Just wow, so good. I, I can't believe how much better this is to me now. Not that I ever disliked it, but it was one of those ones that I watched and really enjoyed, but didn't appreciate for how unique it is. It has a strangely dark and foreboding atmospheric quality to it, bolstered by a strong sense of story and lore that's radically different from almost anything else in DBZ. It goes full on mystical space fantasy and it's all the better for it. Tapion is one of the more underrated and one of my favorite movie characters. I have fond memories of playing the same in the video games such as Tenkaichi 2 and a friend of mine and I have actual inside jokes about him from Tenkaichi 2. More on that later. Anyway, his backstory is both tragic yet heroic and the film doesn't shy away from the stakes and consequences of his entire ordeal. Also, he's obviously inspired by Link from the Legend of Zelda. He even uses an ocarina. Right? And the fact that the film opens with the death of his younger brother is a gut punch that gets your attention immediately. Hoi is an interesting villain that could have used more time to be fleshed out, but his death is hilariously random, and I just wish his motivations were a little bit clearer as the villainous group that he's from, the little cult, is pretty intriguing. However, he is a vessel for the main villain to really come through, and he does just enough to keep things interesting that honestly could be expanded in so much more, maybe in some what-if stories and like Xenoverse down the line. I hope they bring him back, hope they bring that group back, as there's just a ton of potential here. In fact, and I've said this about a bunch of them, this one feels so close to theater animation quality that a bit more of a runtime to dive deeper into the backstory and all characters would have made this near unbeatable. But still, at 52 minutes, it's done quite well and it's paced perfectly. It's so great to have Vegeta in any movie because he's not in very many of them, but his inclusion here is frustratingly short, but massively impactful. We can always want more of him, but when they do something so well with such a short runtime with him in this, it makes me happy. Because it may seem like he isn't in it long enough to make a huge difference, he actually has a very specific character growth moment. While fighting, he goes out of his way to defend and save innocent civilians, who in turn help him to his feet and hold him up. That is some incredible nuance with such short time. What change, what growth, what phenomenal visual storytelling. And could we have gotten more of him? Always. But after what we talked about with Fusion Reborn, and then what, what you know happens in the Kid Buu saga, and then seeing this, he's become a rounded character, and it's it's great. You know, I think some people dismiss this one as just a typical monster movie because of Harutagarn, but Harutagarn is pretty epic. He is an evil incarnate kaiju. And while newer films like Superhero try to kind of go for this concept, it's properly built up for Harutagarn as he's the main threat. He, or maybe I should say it, makes this movie feel like such an old school kaiju film, of which I'm a huge fan of, that happily riffs Godzilla movies, and maybe even some other ones outside of the realm. I wouldn't be mad if they did a version of him in a Godzilla film at this point. He's scary, he's got a memorable design, a transformation that doesn't serve much purpose but makes him more disgusting in a cool way, and a rich backstory. Unfortunately, his origins are a little too vague to really understand, as is the terminology on what he truly is thrown around. But that kind of adds to the mystery, and I'm pretty sure it's expanded in other material. And it's one of those areas where a little mystery is good. It adds to the allure of the monster, but a tad more exposition could have done wonders for the mythology building. Thankfully, it doesn't bother me too much since I was able to find out more information thanks to new media out now. And finally, the title itself. Hinting at the fighting, which is refreshing to see something so unique. The movie pretty much refers to Goku's move, Dragon Fist, or Super Dragon Fist. Now, when Goku uses it, he says Dragon Fire, at least in the English dub perhaps a powered up version. It's a little confusing across the mythos, but it doesn't really matter. It's one of my favorite DBZ super moves because of Budokai 3 and Dragon Ball GT. And it just looks phenomenal. Plus he does it at Super Saiyan 3 after he figures out the weakness on his own. It's probably my favorite form. It's a little unclear if he uses his key to transform into a golden dragon or if it's just like a visual thing. I like to think that he actually finds a way to transform into it. It's just cooler that way. I do have two squabbles that kind of boil down to some missed opportunities, especially in the final battle. The first is a fan service thing, and the other an actual observation. The latter one being that Tapion doesn't really do much of the fighting. 
He could have been more involved in the final battle, and I would have appreciated it if he would have created the wound that Goku exploits for his final move. That way it feels like he made a difference or at least got Trunks to. The other more fan thing I wanted is for a return of the Great Ape. Vegeta could have regrown his tail and transformed to take down the beast or heck even Goten or actually how about Trunks to help him win the fight. Big Kaiju battle, he can't control it. Goku kills the enemy and Tapion cuts off the tail before Trunks can hurt anyone. Oh well, you can't you can't really hold it against the film since it's not there. The title also could have referred to, you know, Shinron fighting. Oh well again, just a bit of a missed opportunity to cash in on the premise with the kaiju fights, yet they play it a little too safe with how it all comes and resolves. Go on and Videl, otherwise known as Great Saiyan Man 1 and 2, feel like real martial arts colorful superheroes here. Fighting an old mystic who resurrects and grows monsters? Sound like Power Rangers versus a Repulsa anyone? No? Just me? Okay. Love seeing how Trunks got his sword. Knowing it's of a space wizard magic background makes it that much cooler. Ha! We can infer, and we later learn from other video games, and possibly even Super, that a version of this happened to future Trunks. We'll love to see that one day. Also, it's pretty cool that there's another, maybe lesser version of it out there that Minosha had. Speaking of that opening, it's chilling, and that poor kid. R.I.P. And you know, knowing what we know about time travel now in DBZ, that it creates alternate timelines or the multiversal theory of within Universe 7, sending Tapion back doesn't create a time loop, but that would create another timeline. It, it actually really is wild how many timelines are in Dragon Ball now, though. <laughs> when we talk about canon, it's easy for this one in particular. It's after Kid Buu's defeat in that time gap. Everything can be canon in a different timeline, and everything is canon in a different timeline. Multiple things are canon to the anime, whether through dreams that you can theorize in your head or many other ways to do it. So I don't like to just dismiss stuff as non-canon because everything's canon or it's intended to be canon in its own little universe. And there's enough timelines that Dragon Ball Super establishes that it's easy to do. Wait, where's Piccolo? Or Krillin? Dang it, there's so many missing people here. These things keep it from being as top tier as it could be. Now that I've kind of sat and thought about it a little bit, it's so close to being perfect. There's just a couple things. Do you hold something against the movie with what they could have done or do you judge what's there? It can be a bit of both. And as I have now reached what was the final official DBZ film that came out for some time without a huge gap, I can honestly say that this one has really jumped for me. I always liked it, but it's actually pretty special amongst DBZ filmography and anime in general. I don't really expect anyone else to have that as high as I do, but I find it strangely deserving. I give Dragon Ball Z, Wrath of the Dragon, five out of five stars. Funny story, Tapion's Ocarina can be used as like an explosive wave type defense move uh, in, in the video games. The move is called the Hero's Flute and it can block any attack in the game. It used to drive one of my best friends nuts, especially with the little tune that followed. Every time I did it, I blocked his attack and he would just go, no, God, this, ah, and it drove him nuts. Good times. Like, subscribe, and always look for the good. This is it.